have a beverage or snacks, anything you may need. Um, so thanks everybody for coming tonight um, for this wonderful, very relevant topic. Uh, my name's Aditi Deeg. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Health Tech Women. And we are partnering tonight with Cellmatics for this great event, Take Charge of Your Biological Clock. Uh, I'm going to spend just a very few brief minutes giving you a little background on who Health Tech Woman is. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization that was founded in 2013. It um, was founded by Carla Brenner, the founder at the time she was working in the pharmaceutical industry, and saw a deep need for women in all silos of healthcare across the spectrum to connect on uh, many levels for innovation, for transferring ideas, but mainly to educate ourselves on the latest trends happening in the healthcare ecosystem because they're happening all the time and it's very fast. Um, we started out with 35 members back then. We are over 20,000 now globally. We have uh, on top of the 20,000, about 15,000 members in UK uh, and we're growing fast. Um, just a little bit about our values. Um, you know, we really value empowering women to be leaders, especially in the healthcare sector. So we are doing events all the time for women, healthcare leaders to educate our community of what's happening. Uh, we are passionate, authentic, collaborative, and growth. So please do, if you haven't already gone on our website, go on our website, it's healthtechwoman.com. Uh, if you're not on our meetup group, uh, please look, at, look us up on meetup, because I know some of you may have signed up through Eventbrite. Uh, but thank you so much for coming. I want to thank our team, Sarah and Christina, for helping us with this event and making this organization grow very fast. And thank you very much to Cellmatics. Uh, I want to do a quick introduction. They will introduce themselves. But tonight we have Angela Lee, who is the Chief Product Officer at Cellmatics, and Dr. Indrana Chatterjee, who is currently the Medical Sciences Liaison at Cellmatics. And they'll give you a little bit more background on themselves. And Take it from here. Thank you. Great. Thank you so Thank much. You. Hi, guys. Uh, I'm Angie. Um, I'm, as she mentioned, the Chief Product Officer at Cellmatics. We want to thank you so much for coming today. Um, I actually think it's so relevant that we're doing this event with health tech um, ladies because it's one of those things where as a, as a founding member of the Cellmatics team, we feel every day the importance of having innovation and growth and having more and more women involved in organizations like ours. So about three or four years ago when we were fundraising um, and trying to you know, really build the business and take it off the ground, um, we had VCs look at us and say, well, you know, women's health is too niche. And you're kind of like, well, we're only 51% of the population, so you're right. Like, it's, it's pretty small. Um, but what, what is so important about having you guys in the room and being involved in this is that there is so much innovation and so much investment happening. And innovation happens by the people who are building it. And all of you um, have a unique perspective to bring. And that perspective can drive investment in development of product, investment in development in companies. And so the more you're out there, you, 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 you know, join forces with 20,000 women, um, members of the organization. I also want to give a shout out to the gentlemen here who are showing as much support for the organization as well. Um, but just to say how important it is and relevant for organizations like this to ensure that there's as much innovation happening as possible. Um, so, uh, this is Indrani Chatterjee. Want to Hi. tell you a little, everyone about yourself? Yeah, so I'm Indrani and I'm the Medical Science Liaison at Cellmatics. My background is that I'm a scientist by training and I do fun stuff at Cellmatics. So what I do is I serve as the, one of the scientific resources for product development. And I've been at Cellmatics for over a year now yeah. and it's been a lot of fun. So Cellmatics is what we, we, we say that we're a next generation women's health company. Um, and what we do is we build products that enable women um, and their partners to make informed decisions about their reproductive health. So we essentially have two products in the marketplace. It's a data analytics platform that's used by physicians in order to help and guide treatment decisions. Um, but we also have a genetic test uh, that we launched this year. It's the first of its kind. And it's a genetic test specifically to help women understand their fertility. Now, um, we'd be transparent about why we're here because part of our mission in all of this is, you know, we launched this product and in doing so, our user research revealed that there was so much misinformation and education about fertility. And um, it's such an important thing for all of us to be as informed about their bodies and to know that we live in an incredible era where technology can enable you to make really informed decisions, unlike any other generation before us, right? 
Um, and so we want you guys today, after tonight's event, to walk away with three goals. The first is we want you to feel more empowered and comfortable talking about your body, making decisions about your body, understanding that you are uh, an you are the owner of your body, to make an obvious statement, but that you actually have, um, that there are innovations in science and technology today that will give you greater control than any generation has ever in the past. Um, and you know, if you think about when you read you know, TechCrunch and all those publications, we're talking about like populating the moon, I mean populating Mars, we're talking about really lofty goals. The same technologies that exist out there to kind of recolonize another, or to colonize another planet can be the same technologies can be used here in your, in your world today to empower you to make decisions, whether that's big data, whether that's genomics. And those things can feel very intimidating for people walking in off the street who don't deal with this every day. But we want you to feel that you can be empowered by leveraging all of that technology and then use it in a good way, in a powerful way. And we want you to walk away with three concrete things that you can do today to empower any decision making in the future. Okay, that's, that's our goal for today. So, and the one thing we want to make super clear that, that, that can be really intimidating to people is that we're not asking you to make any decisions right now. No one has to make any decisions. This is just about giving you as much knowledge as possible about what exists today to be able to help you make proactive decisions to really decode and understand your biological clock. And then from there, you can take that information and make whatever lifestyle decisions you want that are right for you. Um, because what we fundamentally believe is that science is only as good as the applications in which it can make a meaningful difference in everyone's lives, right? And what we fundamentally believe is that everyone in this room should be able to design whatever life you want, right? So for me, what was so important is I, you know, I'm a, a very career-minded woman. I'm also the mother of two kids. Um, I have a nine-year-old and a six-year-old. I live in Brooklyn. I'm home every night for dinner. I try to be. Well, tonight, obviously, I'm not. But, um, you know, but, but what it is, is what dro drove me here, right, what drove me to this, to this company was the growing number of conversations where people were just saying, like, I can't, I can't do this. I can't, I can't balance career and life and career and family and all these things. And, um, you know, we, I, I, you get me started. I can talk for hours about why that's a flawed thing and it's a product of lots of different things. But one of the missions that we have here is to say, look, whatever decision you make, you can choose to have children, you can choose not to have children. You can choose to have 12 children for all you. We just want to make sure that you have the right information so that you're not sitting there down the line saying, if I'd only known, I would have done X, Y, and Z differently. Right? That's, that's all we want to avoid. And so what we don't want to give anyone pressure and say is, oh, well, you must make a decision today. Nope. The decision is for you to make. What we want you to walk away with is that not, gathering knowledge is not decision making. It's simply gathering knowledge, right? Cool. Okay. So um, this is where Indrani and I have like this act. She's the scientist, and she will tell you lots of important science things, and I will be that person that says, oh, but I didn't know that even as a 40-year-old mother of two, um, I learned this here. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to start with reproductive health 101. And I don't want anyone to say, like, oh, my gosh, I grew up in Texas. We had no sex ed. We had no health. A lot of this stuff was so new to me that when I started working here, I was like, oh, my God, I've learned so much. So it was incredibly helpful to have people like Andrani to walk me through this. So we're going to start at the very beginning. And at any point, if you have any questions, yeah. feel free to ask them if you're brave. If you don't want, if you want to email later, that's totally fine too. But there's no, there's no silly question. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So a lot of you must know this picture from your high school textbook. So you probably know what this is. It's the female reproductive tract. But I'm going to sort of just remind you what this is all about. So this is actually a marvelous thing. So what you're seeing here is these two sections. These are the ovaries. This is the fallopian tube. Here's the uterus, and this is the cervix. So this is just an introduction to the female reproductive tract, right? And why are we talking about this? The female reproductive system is extremely complex, and everything happens here. So a girl is born with something like a one to two billion eggs, and by the time she reaches puberty, she has about 300 to 500,000 eggs. So they all sort of attrition or die in the process. And every month a girl has a period, a woman has a period, 
these eggs are recruited by hormones that are secreted by the brain and that, that talk to the ovaries. So these eggs that I'm talking about, this reserve of eggs, these eggs are immature. And an egg, a human egg is the size of a grain of sand. Imagine that, right? And it grows within this fluid-filled sac known as the follicle. So, you know, eggs equal follicles almost. So every month when a woman has a girl has a period, these follicles are recruited by hormones, and then these follicles grow to mature. One follicle, just one of the several that are recruited, becomes the <coughs> dominant follicle and then grows, and then the egg grows with the follicle, and the middle of the cycle, right? And as these follicles grow, they release hormones, estrogen, this, that, and the other, and the hormones are all sort of talking to one another. There's an interplay between these hormones. Middle of the cycle, there's ovulation. What does that mean? A follicle ruptures and an egg is released. So that egg is released into the fallopian tube, and the egg has about 48 hours less than two days pretty much to be fertilized. So if there are sperm present in the fallopian tube at that time, there's fertilization. If not, then the egg goes, undergoes attrition and then, you know, and while all this is happening, the uterus also gets ready for, you know, receiving a fertilized egg and embryo. And if that doesn't happen, then a girl or a woman gets her period. So that's the menstrual cycle for you. And fertility, circles around that, right? And there's all this complex regulation around that, yeah? Okay, so, and then of course, you know, since it's so complex, there can be lots of problems too. So there are some common sort of reproductive conditions you may have heard of. Um, show of hands, how many of you know have, or have heard of endometriosis, right? Yes, so seven million women in the US are diagnosed with endometriosis, right? So it's very common and it's a very, very painful sort of condition to have. So in the previous picture that you saw, sometimes what happens is that you have extra additions and growth in endometrial lining and then that growth gets stuck on the fallopian tube or it, there's extra tissue growing in various parts of the reproductive tract that can lead to inflammation, lots of pain, and also infertility. So it's a very common condition, but it's extremely hard to diagnose. In order to diagnose it, you have to sort of do what is known as a laparoscopy, which is basically you have to look through this telescope with the camera at the end of it and look for these sort of lesions and additions, you know. Um, but and so, you know, the earlier you diagnose a condition like endometriosis, the better it is. So, yeah. So it's so interesting. So um, if any of you guys know Lenny Letter, Lena Dunham is um, someone who's been very, very vocal about her experience with endometriosis. Padma Lashki, who uh, you guys know are probably from Top, Top Chef. Is that right, Top Chef? Mm -hmm. um, she has also been very vocal about it. Endometriosis is a condition that, as, as Indrani said, affects a lot of women. But for some reason, um, it takes a, it's very hard to diagnose. In fact, the average woman takes over 10 years to That's get right. diagnosed with endometriosis, yeah. which is kind of bonkers. Like if anyone, I mean, 10 years, a decade to just figure out, okay, I have this problem with, with my health. So um, the reason we bring this up is what's important in knowing about your reproductive health is also there are conditions that you need to know about it because these conditions, if left undiagnosed or untreated, can lead to complications down the line if, if you ever decide to try to have kids. Um, so this is a common one that you, knowing ahead of time and knowing, so yeah. maybe you can say, what are some of the symptoms of endometriosis? Yeah, so really the heavy periods, pain, pain during intercourse, so these are sort of like the physical symptoms of endometriosis, right? And so then it makes it really, and, but then you really can't diagnose it unless you have like surgery and unless, you know, you have much more complicated diagnoses. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. that's like, oh, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, definitely. But it's one of those conversations where um, knowing what the symptoms are, you can yeah. start to kind of monitor and take a look at those things and then yeah. talk to your doctor about those things. Yeah. Um, another condition that is important for us to highlight in this conversation is also PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome. So, yeah. so PCOS is another extremely complex to diagnose condition. It's very common again. In the general population, it's something around 7 to 15 percent of women have PCOS, you know, including like. Is that Victoria, Victoria Beckham? Beckham. Yeah, yeah. Just, like, it's, yeah. It's like a game because I was like, wait, who? And Daisy. 
Ridley, thank you. Okay, uh, and Jillian Michaels, right? We, we thought about play, playing a game of like putting people's names up, our faces up there, and saying name name that yeah. star. Yeah. yeah, and then the reason why it's complex to diagnose is because there are many things that can be called PCOS, right? You can have a combination of things. So you could have problems with ovulation that can you know, result in PCOS. You can have uh, excess of testosterone hormone and which can lead to you know, excess body hair, this, that, and the other, other kinds of problems because of extra testosterone. Or you could have, I mean, character, I mean typically, women who are diagnosed with PCOS have multiple cysts in their ovaries with these eggs, right? And that can lead to all kinds of complications with fertility. Yeah. And then you can have a combination of any of these things. So yeah. the PCOS basically is like, if, if, correct me, it, it's yeah. basically an imbalance in your hormones imbalance related to hormones. testosterone, yeah. which we all have testosterone in our bodies, but yeah. it just means that you have more than the average woman might. And yeah. it would represent then if you have um, acne, um, if you have um, hair, more hair than a the average woman on your body. Yeah. Uh, in some cases you might have gained weight um, but all of these things, again, it's good things to keep track of, right? And we'll talk a little bit about keeping track of things in your body um, because this is stuff that you can share with your doctor and they can help you manage it either through, yeah. through you know, management and through treatment. And again, PCOS, there was a recent study that was just announced um, that talked about how the diagnosis and management of PCOS early on can actually have longer positive impact on your fertility, right? So we do know that PCOS can affect a woman's ability to conceive in the future the earlier you get, you, you address it. And, it. and addressing it is literally, there might, be, um, there might be some pharmaceutical interventions, but it's also diet. If you, talk, if you go into the message yeah. boards, diet's a huge thing, exercise is a huge thing. You know, the things where you all know you should be taking care of your body in those, you know, those ways, yeah, those are all things that actually contribute. Uh, yeah. to making I think sure. something like 45% of PCOS cases are like metabolic weight issues yeah. and yeah. things like that. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So, what we all know, I mean, if you guys have spent any time in a nail salon getting, you know, getting your nails and reading women's mags, because I'm sure you guys never read these on your own normally, it's just because you're forced to read it in a nail salon, but never <laughs> in real life would you ever read these. Um, fertility is a large part of just the woman's experience, a female experience, right? It's, it is very much, and your you're, you're cover, you're just inundated with stories about this, right? Like, oh, is your body ready for a baby? Like, how long can you wait? Like, and there's a lot of... Um, sound bites that come up in, in media. And so what we wanted to do was, um, and look, there's, there's, there's some science to a lot of what you read in magazines, but you also have to be careful to kind of question a lot of what you read out there. So we wanted to spend a few minutes acknowledging, yes, many of you have probably gotten the vast majority of your information about fertility on, from women's magazines or talking to girlfriends, which is totally fine, but we're gonna kind of tackle a couple of myths that exists out there today, just so you guys can, can, can yeah, misconceptions. Um, and so the first, oh, sorry, whoa, sorry. whoa, 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 wow. Man, you just ruined my jokes, okay. So the first one, the first myth that people often reference is that you shouldn't have any fertility problems as long as you start by 35. I mean, how many of you guys have like had this magic 35 number in your head, like as long as you have a baby by the time you're 35, oh, you should be totally fine, okay. So this is something that's propagated often by women's magazines. Inevitably, there will be some silly press release about how like, you're more likely to hit by a train, by doing X, by the age of 35, whatever. There's all kinds of things that in this link baby era, people will, will kind of wrap around these stats. Okay, but let's, let's look at the science. And Ronnie, maybe yeah. you can walk them so, through the science. So, you know, where that number really comes from is this from this very famous or infamous graph. Uh, what you're seeing here, and for the most scientifically inclined, is the x-axis is age and the y-axis is number of follicles. So, remember the ovarian sort of, you know, the number of eggs a woman is born with, a girl is born with. So, here's the interesting thing, right? As a woman ages, the number of these follicles decreases and you can see there's a rapid decline in the number of follicles beyond this age here, <coughs> right? But it's not just numbers, something else happens too with aging. This dashed line here is basically the quality of these follicles, right? Quality means is the DNA okay? What's happening there? You'll see that the quality of follicles depreciates with, you know, age. What, and why is this going up? It's because the number of poor quality eggs is increasing with increase in age. So that's really what this graph yeah, this is. And this is a super bummer graph. So yeah. this is a super bummer graph. Okay. 
What, but what's, here's what's important for you guys all to, to think about, though. So um, take you back to like third grade math, and you think about what an average is. So essentially what you do when you take an average is you add up everyone in the room, and then you divide it by the number of... So if I were to take all of your ages, add them up, and then divide it by the number of people that are in here, I'd have the average age in here. But that doesn't change the fact that half of you are below average and half of you are above average. Move, removing the quality of average, I'm just saying like as a numerical number, right? Half of you are going to be below and half are going to be above. So here's the, the super bummer part is if you, if you anchor to this 35, right, what you're doing is you're anchoring to the average. And you're saying as long as I start my family before the age of 35, I'm totally golden, I'm totally set. Two things to know. One is, okay, there are just as many women who will have no problem conceiving into their 40s, right, into their 40s, as there are women who may have difficulty before 35, okay? So there are many, many women who will be able to, like, and you hear this all the time. This is the, 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 the stories you hear about, oh, I, my 42-year-old girlfriend got pregnant on her first try. Great. Okay, she's on that side. There are just as many women who may have difficulty sooner. Now, um, recently, so at Cellmatics, we do pride ourselves on the fact that we do as much just kind of research about women and, and users and want to break any kind of um, misconceptions about stereotypes there are about women and how they approach their fertility. So we recently announced this, the results of a 3,000 women survey uh, that were technically within the millennial age range. So I think pretty much every one of you in here. So of the 3,000 women, uh, two-thirds of women said they wanted to start their families in their 30s. Makes sense. People are getting married later. Why would you? I mean, you're, people are getting married at, at 30. So chances are you're not going to be saying you're going to have kids before 30, right? Um, and then of those two-thirds that wanted to have kids, in their, uh, of the, of the two-thirds who want to have kids, 90% of women want to have more than one kid in their lifetime. Okay, so there's a bias against only children. Okay, so um, I get that. Um, so here, here's how the math works out, okay? And, and again, this is our only bummer moment, because from this format on, I promise it's going to be empowering, and you're going to be like, you're going to walk out of here and be like, there are 14 things I can do, and I feel really good. But here's the part that's really tough, is that um, I, am, and I, I and many others share this view that you should be able to design the life you want. But what that means is just knowing what your body may tell you down the line. And so um, what that means is if you're assuming that everything will be golden until the age of 35, when you get to 35, you may have missed any window where there is something that you could have done something about it. Okay? It's not that you have to do something then. It's not that you have to, at the age of 28, have a kid because of all of a sudden this. It's just knowing what you know at 28, right, can help you lay the foundation for when you're ready. And what is fascinating to me is this, is we talk to women and women immediately go, oh God, I can't even think about it, right? We can't even think about it. But here's the thing, think about, um, think about the last time you planned a big birthday dinner. How much effort did you put into finding the restaurant what you were going to order, what the bar menu was going to be. Think about your last vacation. Think about the sheer amount of effort you went into buying the tickets and making sure you got the best price tickets, the perfect hotel, the perfect activities, the perfect playlist for when you're at the pool. You do, in all aspects of your life, you probably do much more planning than you are conditioned to do with your reproductive health. So, what we are hoping to have you guys walk away with after this one bummer moment is to understand is to look into this now. Just look into it now. And then you can say, okay, good. I'm good. I know where, my, where my, my, my foundation is, and then I can go from there. And then you can feel super empowered and super and super on top of it. Cool? Yes, question. I, I, <laughs> you both had questions. Okay. Sorry, my question is it's probably also one of the misconceptions. A lot of people sort of say, you know, after 40, the quality of your eggs goes down. So it's possible there may be certain symptoms or certain. Mm -hmm. It's true. You know, defects with your baby, so that's why a lot of people sort of push towards yeah. 35. Yeah. So, like, you look at me because that's also my magic number. <laughs> so, your data that you guys are looking at and um, collecting, does it actually prove to, does it show that women who have babies at 40, the numbers of defects with, with the baby is more than if you have it before a certain age? Does, is, that, is that an urban myth or is it this some stats? So egg quality definitely does go down over time, and what, while we do, and others jump in, as, yeah. as far, what our research is focused on is, you know, um, the vast majority of our, our, our data has been collected from 
uh, reproductive endocrinologists, IVF clinics, because that is the only place where you can get as much documented information about a woman's fertility. That's just because of the nature of where they're at. Because think about the last time you went to OB. Like, what metrics do they gather about your ovarian reserve? Probably not much, right? So what we can tell you is that performance to, and in other words, like how many eggs you produce when you're doing a stimulation or the number of aneuploidy eggs, which yeah. are um, uh, basically eggs with incorrect number of chromosomes, right. which then could lead to, you know, birth defects, right. miscarriages. Exactly. Yeah. Those do increase yeah. over time. Yeah. So for that reason, what, what, with, the, with the advent of new technology today, which allows people to freeze eggs or freeze embryos, what they'll often say is it is always better yeah. to have younger eggs. Yeah. Um, and what they say right now is, I believe the science says, between the 27 and 30 is about the time when your eggs are of its highest quality. Yeah. Okay. Just to be clear, I had my first kid at 30 and my kid at 34. So I'm not advocating that everyone run out. So like, what I'm saying is, um, that is just what science says. But knowing that information, there's ways for you to kind of harness that knowledge just to make decisions yeah. about that. Is there an age cutoff for um, freezing your eggs at clinics in the US? Uh, not that no, know no, no, not that mm -hmm. we know of, but it is recommended the younger the better, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Did you also have a different question? Yeah, I have a question. So how do you know, if 35 is the myth, right, uh -huh. how do you know for yourself yeah. what is a good age? Great. So, so there's, there's two ways of thinking about good age. Right, so there's the biological piece, and then also just your lifestyle piece, right? So just because I say like, oh yeah, your your ideal time, right, that your body produces the best eggs between 27 and 30 is not necessarily the best time to have your family. Um, what we essentially are trying to do at Cellmatics is to decode the biological clock, which is to help people understand, okay, what do your genes tell you about your your propensity for risk? for conditions in the future that may influence your fertility, right? And we can talk a little bit more about that. Essentially, as our genetic tests actually will tell you, if you test positive for risk factors that suggest that you may have difficulty conceiving in the future, related either to the number of eggs you have, related to other conditions. Yeah. 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 But, uh, I mean, this is what's so exciting about the work that we're doing. I mean, I can say that a completely unbiased way. Um, we're super excited because essentially this is the world's first genetic, comprehensive genetic screen that looks at a woman's fertility potential. Okay, so that will tell you like ballpark what it would be. Not ages, but whether or not, not you age, have risk yeah. factors that may influence your ability to conceive in the future. So you wish me to do it earlier, if you can. Sorry? So that would mean do it earlier if you, if you can. Yes, if you yes, yeah. I mean, my plan is when my daughter turns 22, she's taking this test. <laughs> <laughs> That's. It's like I, I, have, I have this vision that one day, like you know, egg freezing will be part of your graduation package. But anyway, that's just my, my vision. Um, there were other there were other hands that went up. Yes. Yeah, on the same point of the uh, genetics, like my mom didn't have me until she was thirty seven, which is crazy. I'm thirty now, so to think about like that day and age did. Yeah. Yeah. People were having kids when they were like twenty two. Right. Um, so like, where does like her like yep. those yeah. genes in comparison to like me. That's a great question. We're actually going to talk about that as well because it's great that you know that about your mother. Not many women have talked to their mothers about their fertility. Um, and that's a great proof point to have. But the other side to that is that you get half your genes from your dad's side of the family. Right. So it's also important for you to understand what happened on your dad's side. So um, I'll go into more detail and give you questions you should be asking and how to have those conversations. But um, we'll get into that next. Yeah. Um, myth number two. We hear this all the time. Taking birth control can make it harder to have kids in the future. I, I, has anyone heard that before? Or yeah, uh huh, yeah. Uh, Indrani, what's the answer to this? No. <laughs> <laughs> the simple answer is no. Yeah, it's a myth. And but what birth control is really doing is preventing ovulation. So that's really how birth controls. They they're a combination of progesterone and estrogen, which are like hormones. And yeah. So really what birth controls are, cause control is doing is that preventing ovulation, so then there's no fertilization, and then you're okay, right? But it doesn't make it harder to have kids in the future, so yeah. So yeah. it doesn't matter what birth control you're using? Ah, good question. You know, uh, well, sometimes the low-dose ones can cause ovulation, but oh, it doesn't yeah, matter. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, gosh, you guys are asking all the questions, <laughs> like jumping ahead, I want to be like, oh, we're going to get to that. Um, so for the most part, most people are worried about um, hormonal birth controls, yeah. right? Because those are the ones that people That's are, true. are yeah, thinking yeah. about. You know, obviously, condoms, barrier yeah. methods will have no impact whatsoever in your ability to conceive in the future. Um, there are no studies that show that there's a long-term effect of copper IUDs. So um, yeah. for the most part, universally, 
Now, um, the research, the science has shown is, I mean, we have some other scientists here from Cellmatics. Does anyone else have anything to add here? Anna? Anna's standing. I, 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 she will always be the first to correct me on if I got something wrong. So, yeah. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about, though, about that birth control yeah. piece. Cool. Um, myth number three, having an abortion in the past can impact your ability to have kids later in life. So can I ask a question about the second myth? Oh, yes, yeah, sure. yes. Sorry, I jumped ahead. Yeah, no worries. Um, I just wondered, so, but I, I, some of the stuff I've uh, read, which might be mythical, has been that um, the reason that people say that taking birth control can affect your ability to conceive later is that it throws off their body's like, natural rhythm. And yeah. You know, it's funny, my, my OB told me that when I told her, I went and talked to her. I was in grad school and I was like, I'm thinking about having kids in the, few, in, in the next year. She's like, ugh, you should get off your birth control pill. It'll take your body a while to adjust. I got literally pregnant in the first month. So look, here's, here's what it is, is if, if there was any difficulty underlying it, so the one thing is yeah. birth control pills can actually mask underlying issues that you may already yeah. have, right? Yeah, so, so that can happen. So if you, so some women uh, can have early menopause and you know, again, talk to your family about this, right? And if you are one of those women who's predisposed to having early menopause, then birth control can mask that because you know, you just don't know like how regularly you're ovulating or you just don't know what your regular cycle is. So it can be masked because of birth control and there could be problems because of that. It's not directly caused by birth control, but it's, you know, indirect in some sense. So that can be one issue. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But in terms of any large scale studies, none have yeah, shown no to have a correlation in the long term. Yeah. Um, I mean, well, everyone. That, I mean, I can't say no, right? <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, the whole premise tonight is the fact that you should be making personalized choices, mm -hmm. right? Um, and uh, in terms of what studies have shown for birth control, um, it will not have an impact. Now, I will say, if that is something that is con uh, concerning to you, or I mean, I don't, I don't want to signal you out, to anyone in the room, what I would suggest then is there are other birth control methods out there that are non-hormonal, right? Uh, copper IUD is a very good, like very reliable method that lasts forever. Um, there are other methods that you can use um, in order to, to alleviate that. You know, um, again, sharing as much information about myself as I can, um, I made the choice of to stop using hormonal um, birth control pills after I had my second kid. And I, it was a lot of things. It was like, I want to, just, I want to understand how my body works. Yeah. I started yeah. here. I was like, oh, I just want to see what happens. Um, and it was, you know, it's, it's a choice that you can make. And so if you have any reservations, see what happens, right? Try that out and see what happens. Yeah. Yep. Actually, yeah, yeah I mean, no, that's another myth. Actually, it's yeah. not like you have. So it's very important. So remember how I was saying that these eggs that we have, they're immature, and immature eggs cannot be fertilized. So the whole process, when a follicle grows, you know, every month of the cycle, the egg goes through a process called as maturation. So you know, even when you're on the pill, or if it's hormonal birth control. These eggs are still undergoing, you know, maturation. They're just not, you're just not ovulating in the same mm -hmm. way. So, you know, it's not like you have more eggs left over or anything right. like that. Because I think even for yeah. me, visually, I imagine like I had like a ton of just eggs just sitting there, like in a sack waiting. And it was like, one, like it was dispensed, like in a, a cereal dispenser, right? Or yeah. like a Pez dispenser. Yeah. Um, no, it's not like that because your body actually kind of matures them through a series of hormones each month. Yeah. Now, the, the benefit of birth control is for if you have endometriosis, if you have PCOS, right. Right. it is often used as a way of leveling your hormones so as to manage the symptoms. So there are health benefits. And again, I am not a doctor. We are yeah. not here to provide clinical advice. My, my legal team will be very happy to hear that I said that. Talk to your doctor about these things because it is very personal and they can tell you a lot of that information. Yeah. The one thing that's Time things, yeah. 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 Did you have a question? Yes. Yeah. 
So if birth controls can uh, you know, mask the underlying issues that might be yep. developing, is there a way to, to test or determine if sorry, somebody might be going through them? Without even knowing it? If there's, so um, many times with, with things like endo and PCOS, you'll see symptoms earlier on when you're yeah. younger. Um, and so even before you're on birth control. Um, uh, the other thing that you can do is, again, our test actually reveals if you have genetic markers for those things. Yeah. I feel like this is turning into an infomercial. But yeah. Um, so myth number two. Myth number, myth number three, having an abortion in the past can impact your ability to have kids later in life. We hear this all the time. Um, this is not true. Now, with any surgical procedure, if you have scarring or risk of scarring, right, those types of things, those kinds of complications could impact. But simply having an abortion, using the morning after pill, um, using RU486 will not have a lasting impact on your fertility, no matter what some people tell you. Okay. Um, myth number four, taking antidepressants will interfere with your ability to conceive. Andrani. Yeah. So SSRIs, common, you know, antidepressants. So they suppress libido and then, you know, you can have sort of indirect effects because of that, but none of them will actually. There's no evidence to show that they actually decrease fertility in any way or your ability to conceive. Yeah. If at all, it's indirect. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, so just so we're talking about myths, here are the things that actually can affect your fertility. So your age. So as we've already talked about this. As you get older, uh, quality starts to decline, as does the quantity of your eggs. Um, family history. Uh, we talked. Someone mentioned back there that their mother has um, a fantastic fertility history of proof points of being able to conceive into their 40s. If you have a family history of um, a mother who um, took longer or suffered miscarriages throughout the journey, that can also influence or may be a telltale sign of what may lie ahead. Um, I don't have to tell you this. Smoking is bad for you. Big surprise, <laughs> news break. Okay, smoking is bad for you. You know this. It's bad for you in many ways, including on your fertility. Um, sexually transmitted infections, uh, excess weight gain or loss. So either direction, really, really unhealthy for your body. So just keep that in mind. And then extreme emotional and physical stress resulting in this period. So not like New York style stress of like, oh my God, I'm so stressed, right? Like my life is so hard. Not that type of stress. We're talking the kind that actually causes you to stop having periods. And then that type of stress may influence your longer term fertility. Any questions on this one? Um, what about alcohol? Oh, yeah. hey, okay. So the, we, we grouped the last three, okay? We grouped the last three for, for one main reason is excessive alcohol. The word excessive is a non, like, there's no definitive definition of excessive. I can't tell you. So really, really heavy drinking over a prolonged period of time, the kind of drinking that would have a long-term health effect on your body will also have a health effect on your fertility. Some prescribed medications, again, it is important that you are transparent with your doctor about what you want to do, and you can certainly ask, will this have any impact? And they can answer those questions. And then recreational drug use. Um, what I, will say, what I will say about this is that we all know that there are harder, there's a in continuum of hardness of drugs, right? So if you are a meth user or a coke user or a smack user, that's one category. Weed is a totally different category, okay? Let's be, like, let's be realistic in thinking about like, what, that, what that looks like. If you would not tell your mother you're doing it, then it's probably not a good idea, right? Like that's my litmus <laughs> test that I always use. You know, I, you know, anyway, so just, just in general, recreational drug use, if it's, but generally it's like your body, your, your, your uterus is connected to everything. It's like this giant holistic system. If it's bad for your body, it's yeah. bad for the, down there as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good stuff. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes, please. The last slide. Just for that one. I think that's a good question to discuss with your physician because you know if you're an athlete and you know and you're just putting your body through a lot of strain, then you could have you know problems with your period and what that may result in. And you may be high healthy otherwise, right? So that's definitely a physician discussion, I would say.
Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, I, I, right, because it, yeah. it depends on what, Again, the, it depends. what the situation yeah. was, the length of time. Yeah. Um, but for most people, when you know who live in New York, and the, the stress levels are not the extreme, the extreme stress levels. That yeah, yeah. Okay. That was a very unsatisfying answer. I'm sorry. Yeah, we don't have an answer <laughs> for that one. Um, okay, so the realities of consuming. So we were talking about myths, but here are some some yeah. facts that are, yeah. that may also be surprising to you. Yeah, what's uh, really surprising also is that humans as a species are really bad at this so a healthy woman who's trying who's fertile at the age of 30 only has a 20 percent chance of conceiving so in a single cycle in a single cycle in a single cycle, in a single cycle. yeah so you know it's really low if you think so about which it. is funny because I feel like I spent like most of my life being told I was gonna get pregnant if I like if someone like <laughs> like sneezed on me and um, <laughs> And, and so then, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, you know, um, then you go into trying and all of a sudden you're like, wait, it's actually a little bit more complicated than one would think. Um, and it has to do with the fact that it is um, based on timing, right? Yeah. So, so, yeah. so again, um, remember that ovulation thing that I was telling you about? So there's really a really short window when this mature, this egg has to be mature and has to be in the fallopian tube and you have to have sperm present there and then maybe there's fertilization, maybe there's not, right? So yeah, so it's a really short time window. And so really, uh, timed intercourse is mm -hmm. something we talk about a lot when someone's trying to get pregnant. Timing is everything. Yeah, timing yeah. is everything. And also, I did not know, I did not know that you fertilize the egg in the fallopian tube. Yeah. And then, <laughs> see, I'm not the only one. You guys are all looking puzzled. So you actually fertilize in the fallopian tube, then the fertilized egg yeah. moves down and attaches to the uterine wall, okay, which is not what I thought. So that essentially means that the sperm has to swim all the way up there, fertilize it, yes. and then come back down. Yeah. Now, the other thing to know is that there is a stat that says that a very large percentage of, even if you get fertilization, a very large percentage yes. of fertilized eggs never implant. implant okay. Um, these are, um, so with, with pregnancy tests now, they can sense so early as to like, and what they often sometimes refer to as biochemical pregnancies, right? So it's right. like they, they sense the hormones were starting, but it just didn't attach yeah. there. Yeah. And so that's actually a very common part of kind of the experience. And so it, it was surprising to me how hard it actually is for us to procreate, which b makes biological <coughs> sense because having a baby for us is a much more intense experience and you don't you know you're not a puppy that have that has a litter of a litter of seven puppies right you yeah. want this to be hard otherwise yeah. or harder otherwise you would end up with seven children I mean, you want seven children it's fine <laughs> but um that would be it's it's, yeah. it's a lot of energy on the body it's a lot well. of energy on the body yeah. so um any, yes Yeah. So natural well, uh, family planning, people yeah. use it all the time. Yeah. Uh, when you are trying to conceive, basal body temperature and fluctuations in it can suggest when your body is releasing an egg, and then you can have timed intercourse at that time. And then, you know, and, and the thing to remember too is like that, you know, fertilization is as much a male, uh, it, it's as much on the woman as it is on the man. So there can be 50% of infertility in the world is actually related to male factors. Male factors, so, yeah. So, but a basal body temperature is a uh, very widely used mechanism for, or a uh, metric used to kind of time ovulation. Yeah. You can track it. You can actually it's track it. It's like two it. degrees. Yeah. Two degrees higher. But yeah. It can often be something that, I mean, temperature is temperature. So if you went on a run and then just took your temperature, it will be different. So it has to be a very, very yeah. um, accurate process. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. many times, um, so people who practice natural fine planning will often take their, their measurement like first thing in the morning when they first wake up. So, because you're, you know, you've been sleeping all night, and you, it, it's a, it's a, a more even time. And if you take it the same time every day, then you can at least have a measurement of it yeah. over time. And yeah. again, it's like um, all of these apps and wearables that they're selling now to do basal body temperature and stuff. What they do is they say that there's like a training period where you have to kind of condition it to say, okay, here's what my typical temperature looks like. This is the path it follows. And then what they can do is start to search for irregularities. It's about, it's, it's a big data kind of analytics yeah. thing. Yes. This um, XP Bounds too, this company, Natural Cycles or whatever, they also, I mean, 
prognosis that they can can't get pregnant if not, if we're not ovulating. Correctly. It's true. Yeah. It's true. Like, yeah. But it's not a reliable. Well, it, it, well, okay, it is interesting. Yeah. Um, actually, is that the next one about the, about the, the birth uh, control? Yeah. yeah. So it's like you just punted that up to me. Um, <laughs> the other part to this is that your birth control is not nearly as perfect as you think. So um, there are uh, pills out there that are low dose, estrogen pills are low dose, mini pills. Oh, mini pills, low dose progesterone. Yeah. yeah. And those are, so the way they can do low dose is it essentially means that your metabolite, like it gives you such a small dose that you will metabolize it 24 hours. So you have to take the, the same pill at the same time every single day. Yeah. Um, so what that means is there's a failure rate in there. So there was actually a study recently that yeah. showed that withdrawal can be as effective as some birth control method, like birth control pills. Um, similarly, using that, using that method in conjunction with natural family planning, which means you just abstain the two days or the three days during your fertility window, can actually be effective. Uh, I, I'm not advocating for this, just to be clear, but it is something that is widely used as, as a mechanism for birth control. Yeah. One, one thing I will add to that is that sperm can live in the uterus for seven days, so it is a larger window. Yes, two days good yeah. point. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have a question? Uh, so to the extent that women need to know, like you started with by saying today is about knowing about yep. you can decide later. To the extent that you need to know, you need to know as much information as possible. Um, to what extent are men responsible for infertility in couple? So male factor is actually responsible for as many as much as uh, 50% yeah. of the cases yeah so so in as much as you know there are things that you can certainly do if you're male fertility I, I am not a male fertility specialist but what you can do is there are things that you can do um, to ensure your longer-term health which are things like you know it has smoking, to do all those smoking things. alcohol yeah. many of the same things so be yeah. good be kind to your body and then also it has to do with like um, not having your laptop on your lap all the time not carrying your phone in your pocket um, yeah, there are these things that they say do relate to sperm quality over time. Yeah. I don't know how much of that is true, but what I would suggest is if you have specific questions about that, there's certain, uh, we can point to you resources online that are yeah. great. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, but men are equally responsible. Just, just, sure. just to sure. be clear. Yes, yes, yes. If not more, <laughs> right? If not more. No, I'm kidding. Okay. Um, cool. So, uh, we talked about clinical stuff. Let's talk about genetics. Um, genetics. Genetics. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so what do we know about genetics, right? There's a huge fertility, it's in your DNA. It's true, there's a huge familial component to fertility. So that's why talking to your family is sort of uh, important, you know. All of us, you know, as humans, we're all very sort of similar. But then, you know, there are all these subtle differences amongst us. And then, you know, just by talking to your family, you will know a lot, you mm -hmm. know, you can find out a lot and, you know, you can sort of then make decisions based on that kind of knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. So um, what do we have next? Yeah, so if we just think about genetic traits, right? Um, we all know that height is a genetic trait, right? So, but then again, there are things that we know are simple. For instance, that simple, by simple I mean they're controlled by just one gene. So curling your tongue, you know, Lots of people can't do that. So that's a simple trait. I know every right? one of you is trying it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, tasting cilantro, that's one single gene. You know, some people apparently taste cilantro as soap. So that's one gene. I think hitchhiker's thumb is another one. There are several of those, right? But things like height, fertility is not simple at all. There are many, many factors involved, many genes, and how all these genes talk to one another matters, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's not just what you inherit, right? There's more than that. It's complex. It's your genetics and other things, yep. right? So. Um, so this is a symbolic <laughs> family tree. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Oh <laughs> and Johnny was like, why is there a tree in the middle of that? I know. It's lovely. Uh, so <laughs> yeah. again, this is to reinforce that it goes on both sides of your family. So the natural starting place for fertility is often talking to your mother, talking to your sisters, and that's a great place to start. Um, but then you should also be thinking about the women on the other side of your, of your family tree, so your dad's side of the family. So that would be your paternal grandmother, your aunts on your dad's side, because you can just as easily have gotten influences on that genetic side as on that side. So um, it's interesting. So yeah, so 
the reason why it's 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 complex then is like we can say a starting place is talking to your parents and your uh, family members, but over time to really understand what's in your genes, you actually need to look at your own genetics. Yeah. Yeah. So genetics is not destiny. Again, that's so, the good news. Is yeah. none of this is set in stone, right? right. Just because you, I mean, with the except, okay, fine. Your tongue rolling is set in stone, but like, <laughs> but what what we what we know about genetics is this: is that um, just because, with the, particularly with complex yeah. traits, is just because you have markers for things or have risk for things, it does not necessarily mean they will come true, right? Right. You you may be at risk, but that doesn't mean you'll sort of get it, right? But you can take certain steps to make sure that you know you stay healthy. So. If you know someone had lung cancer in your family, it's a good idea not to smoke. And it's a good idea not to smoke in that general. That should be the big takeaway for tonight: <laughs> yeah. is don't smoke. Yeah. yeah. So you know, so things like that are important, right? Just so that you know, it's not set in yeah. stone for sure. Right. And so yeah. there are things that you cannot change, right? You cannot change your genes, but there are things that you can control. And the things together, your genes plus lifestyle, right? Plus exercise. All those things you can control will um, influence the longer term likelihoods or outcomes. Yeah. So knowing that you can control your weight, knowing that you can exercise more, knowing that you can stop smoking, uh, that you can eat better, um, and that you can just make smart choices in your lifestyle, it's all the things that would make your mom proud. Those are all the things <laughs> that go into that column. Yeah. Okay, so be proactive. You can do it. And here's what you can do next. So um, you were all on your phones. I've been watching you. Um, put your phones to good use and download a period tracker. Okay, you should be able to tell me when, how long your 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 cycle is. You should be able to tell me when you're ovulating. I mean, not me, but like, okay, in general, <laughs> you should be able to tell yourself like, know when you're ovulating. Um, this period tracker, I am a huge fan of Clue. We're friend, we're also very friendly with them as well as a company. Glow is another company that's very. Um, Aunt Flo's got. Uh, they, they they are hilarious. Okay, so Clue is all about like data and like empowerment. Aunt Flo is like your period sucks. We know it. We'll help you get through it. Right. Their tone is just very different. So pick one that speaks to you, that like really resonates with you, but really do yourself a favor and download this because over time you'll start to see patterns. And you know we've. Our friends at Clue have actually been able to diagnose endometriosis and PCOS in a patient based just on the inputs into their period tracker. Mm -hmm. That information is really powerful. So yeah. literally, while you're doing it right now, there's the, the Wi-Fi right there. You can see the Wi-Fi right there. Download this and start putting your stuff in. Okay. <laughs> um, if we weren't clear about this before, talk to your mom or talk to your family. Um, so speak to your mother, your grandmother, your sister, aunts to gather your family history. And these are the questions you should ask them just to start. Um, if you go to our website, we also have a Medium post that goes directly into this with a script. Whoa. With a script that literally, so we have found that women often have a difficult time talking to their mothers about their reproductive history, um, probably because reproductive health is too tight. It's kind of closely tied to sex and who wants to talk to their mom about sex. So we actually have a script that can literally say like, hey mom, I'd like to learn more about your reproductive health. It's a script. It'll, it'll make you feel better. But this is the kind of information that you should gather for all of the women in your life. And then, talk to your OBGYN. Hopefully she's as friendly looking as this one is. <laughs> and, um, and the questions you can ask them are, can I take an ovarian reserve test? So there is a clinical test that will tell you where your AMH, your hormones are, and your AMH, right? Yeah. It's an AMH test. Um, and then, can we look at my genes? And this is where I tell you about our test, right? Because our test is the only test that will actually look at your genes on a fertility level. Okay, so Fertilome is the world's first and only genetic test for women's reproductive health and fertility. It's comprehensive. It looks at 49 markers on 32 genes, and it looks at endometriosis, PCOS. It will tell you if you're at, early risk for, uh, at risk for early menopause. Um, that is essentially a condition that would suggest that you would have difficulty sooner. So the closest proxy of are you before 35 or after 35 in, in terms of your fertility curve, I would say that the early menopause markers, the POI markers, are probably yeah. the closest proxy to that right now. Uh, similarly, dimensional variant reserve. And it will tell you if you're at risk for miscarriages in the future as well. Um, and again, the miscarriages in the future, it's kind of a scary thing, but mm -hmm. knowing that it is the case is actually quite powerful, right, to just know, okay, this is what my body will do. Here are some questions that will help you answer. If you should consider freezing your eggs, 
how do you frame family building in the context of career and lifestyle? So like many of you, like when I moved to New York, all I wanted to do was build my career and worry about that. I wanted to figure out how do, I, how do I fit family building into all this? This can be a powerful thing that helps you with that. This will help you diagnose, or not diagnose, it will identify risk factors associated with endometriosis or PCOS. So if you want to know if you have, if your painful periods are more than just painful periods, it will tell you this. Um, if you should consult a specialist, if you're trying to conceive on your own. So if anyone here is trying to get pregnant on their own and you're starting to worry, like, okay, we've been trying for a while, my friends didn't take this long, this will tell you if you should accelerate your referral to a specialist. And then if any of you are going through infertility, uh, treatment right now. This can actually give you more information to kind of fine-tune your, your in, infertility treatments. Okay. Um, so I'll just quickly yeah. go through. Just yeah, some cases, yeah. So these are stories from patients who have taken the test, just kind of how they use the test um, and how it helped them. So this is Nicole. Nicole is 29, and Nicole wants to have a good, big family one day, right? And so she's considering what she can do today in order to plan for the future. So Nicole took a test. She mm -hmm. took a test, and it turned out she was positive for two markers. Mm -hmm. One was uh, a marker for what is known as repeated pregnancy loss, and the other one was a marker for primary ovarian insufficiency. So what does that mean, right? Primary ovarian insufficiency means that you could be in the path for early menopause. That puts you at risk. And then repeated pregnancy loss means that you could have problems. You know, remember Angie was saying there's that whole process of implantation that happens after, you know, a, an egg is fertilized. So you could have problems at that stage that could lead to miscarriages. So given that information, Nicole then talked to her physician and decided to do egg freezing. She'd come in thinking she'll do a round of egg freezing, but I think knowing that, she realized maybe she should do like two rounds of egg freezing. So every time a woman goes through egg freezing, she has to you know, go through a process where a physician will give her certain hormones. So instead of having just one follicle growing during her menstrual cycle, she can have several, and then they can then retrieve those eggs and then freeze them for, you know, it's just a banking process, yeah. Okay, so that's Nicole's case. This is Maxine. So yeah. Maxine, she is a, a classic example of um, someone, she and her husband, we were both very invested in their careers and just wanted to know, could, it, could we wait a little before we had kids? It um, turns out that she actually does have markers associated with potentially um, having a curve that's shifted left a little bit earlier. And so they decided to start a family earlier, just based on that information. They decided to start trying earlier. Um, and just having that information meant that, like, okay, it's, it's a question of, okay, do we try earlier or do we prepare ourselves for IVF or some type of, of fertility treatment down the line? So it's a choice that anyone can make. Yeah. Yeah. Natalie. This, Natalie. Ah, oh, Natalie. Painful yeah. periods. Yeah. She had painful periods and wasn't sure what was causing them, wanted to know if there might be something more. Turns out she has and markers associated with endometriosis. So that actually helped her physician kind of plan a path around this and helped her. The large part of just knowing there's an explanation for what you experience each month can be an incredibly powerful piece of information. So that was very helpful for her. Yeah, and some women don't even experience the pain but may have endo and then may have problems with fertility. So, you know, this is just, you know, another case, yeah. And, and then Stephanie, Stephanie. Is our IVF? Yes. Oh, yes. yes. So it was, um, Stephanie, unfortunately, was having difficulty conceiving and she uh, began infertility treatments and failed two cycles um, of infertility treatments. She took a fertilum test and yeah. it revealed some additional subclinical information that her doctor didn't have. So um, there, there's what's called clinical information, which is the stuff that you can observe in your body through existing tests. With this particular patient, um, they discovered several markers and information about yeah. her, her uterine. L yeah, so you know, one of the ways physicians measure you know, fertility is by measuring hormones. But then you know, hormones fluctuate so much, right? So when uh, this patient, Stephanie, took the test, she she had markers, several markers. She had markers for repeated pregnancy loss. She had markers for repeated implantation failure. So lots of things going on, right? And so then with that information, her physician actually changed the Was protocol. able to change her protocol. And yeah. she is actually our first fertilone baby. So we helped uh, a woman uh, after several failed cycles actually get pregnant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So 
that concludes our conversation, but certainly, does anyone have any questions? We're gonna stick around, so you guys can totally, <laughs> <Yeah>. yes. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, it's a window, you know, from like 20, 12 to 48. I mean, that's a window, so, you know, it varies. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, oh, yes, go ahead. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're single and you're not ready to have kids yet. You're starting a career like, what's the next step from that? <laughs> right. So that's something that we hear a lot, right? So. Um, there are a growing number of centers in the, so, so say you are a single woman and say in the, you get a, a, a test result that suggests that you may want to, say example, freeze your eggs. In which case then, there are several centers throughout the city that have made it more affordable over time in order to do this. Because as um, it's become more and more common, which if, speaking from pure economic terms, there's more competition in New York City, which means that there's more clinics that are popping up. We can actually provide to anyone here who's interested names of um, centers in the city that do offer really um, Plans. Great financing plans mm -hmm. that enable you to do this. And I think what, what, what we have heard a lot of is this, is that um, uh, the information can clarify whether or not a cost is worth it to the patient, right, to the woman who takes the test. Um, and what we've heard is it can either be self-financed. We've also heard that a lot of parents get involved in this process and um, because they also want to help in this process. So if that's something that's available to you as well, you can have an open dialogue because we hear from lots of people that that's often a, a path that others can use. So. How much is the test? The test is 950. Um, so there's financing on the website that allows you to do three payments at 0% interest. We have also included a $200 voucher in your bag along with physicians in the area that provide the test. Uh, so you can actually use the financing with the voucher, which means that you can split it up for like a cost of a New York City dinner for three months. What's your experience with insurance? We, we do not have insurance coverage right now. So we, we launched in January, and unfortunately the payer cycle is just a little bit unwieldy, if you guys can imagine, with insurance companies. So right now it's out of pocket. You can yeah, use it, you yeah. Can use that. yeah. Yes? Is it true that um, if you keep an IUD in for longer than it's supposed to be, like I know for like Marina, it's about five years, and mm -hmm. copper is about 10. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, if you keep the copper in longer than that, is it true that that can cause um, difficulty like, in pregnancy? I don't know the answer to that, actually, to be honest. But, you know, talk to your doctor. Yeah. yeah, talk to your doctor. Talk to your I mean, doctor. There, there are, um, we, we probably have all an heard anecdotal stories yeah. about complications yeah. associated with IUDs. Talk to your doctor about your yeah. concerns and they can, they can like, yeah. probably clear that up for you. Yeah. yeah. When you're like, switching birth control, you're going on and off, does that have an impact or? On your long-term fertility? Yeah. No. Um, you know, again, no birth control has been shown to have a long-term effect on uh, hormonal birth control, so I, I don't. Yeah. think that that would apply, yeah, in terms of switching around. Yes? Um, so if you decide to freeze your eggs, does that decrease your potential of being able to conceive naturally? Or is your only option to then... No, no, no. So yeah. in fact, many people who, I, I have many friends who have frozen their eggs and they never used them. Mm -hmm. um, so the way they, they rationalize it, it's, it's like um, it's insurance. As, a, as, a, uh, as an option if something doesn't work out. Um, I've also had friends who have used them later on. So I have a very good friend in LA who froze her eggs, she got pregnant with her husband, and then they decided to try again, and then that's when they used their eggs as, uh, for their second child. Um, you guys said that you think that your eggs are at like, their optimum quality between 27 and 30. So hypothetically, we are going to have to do the best means that you want to go through with egg freezing. You, it'd be advisable to wait no, the younger you are, the better it is. Okay. Yeah, yeah. There's no the average. Yeah, yeah. That all factors come Yeah, yeah. Can you tell a little bit about the test? Like, what kind of samples 
Oh, wow. Yes. Uh, yes, those are good <laughs> questions. Uh, it's a blood test. So you would have to go to your doctor to get them to order the test. Um, we actually have a list of providers in the bag that you can go to, and all of them have been prepared to are ready for your phone calls. Um, and it's a 15-day business day turnaround. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. What's, uh, are you doing this just for New York, United States, or it's also in other countries? Uh, we hope to be in other countries one day. Right now, it's, it, it's in the United States, um, but we are fielding a lot of interest from outside the United States. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I also have another question that I want to ask. Um, there's a lot of these people going around that say that if you choose not to have kids, the chances of you getting breast cancer are <coughs> Yeah, no, so there's, there's a lot of, there are some studies. I mean, I've seen studies on both sides. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. Do you have a comment on this one? This is a hard one. No. I think this one's a doctor one. Yeah. Uh, to be honest, I think that the science on that one is still not defined. It's, yeah. It goes kind of both ways depending on the population and study. And, and what your predisposition yeah. is and, you know, those sorts of things. So, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, when you have a low IUD, a lot of people stop getting their period. Do you know why that is? Oh, that's... A hormonal IUD? Yeah. Well, I think it's because it's interfering with your natural cycle. So it's just that, you know, a lot of women, it kind of puts off your natural cycle and, you know, it prevents ovulation. So then that throws other things off. Yeah. But that's not any, it's not No, any no. So when you get, yeah, yeah. You can't be on it if you're trying to get pregnant because you can't time things. But other than that, no. Any other questions? We will be, oh, yes. One last question. Yes. Um, what's DOI because in one of your slides? Uh, it's diminished ovarian reserve. Yes. Yeah, that's what it stands for. Again, you know, often it's one way of saying that the number of eggs you have available is decreasing. Yeah. It's a form, uh, it's, it, you know, there's a period of time when you go into a phase of, of sub-fertility, essentially. Yeah. yeah. And that's that, that period of time. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, we are around. There's many other Solmatics folks around, too, so you can certainly ask them any question. And um, like I said, there's tote bags, walk around proud. Um, and there is um, information about the test inside there as well. So thank you very much for coming thank tonight. You. It was wonderful.